I don't, you know, I'm self-taught. I didn't go and have all these great connections with all these, you know, uh, institutions and people within institutions. So a lot of it was kind of paving my own way. Print friends, and welcome to the 86th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can also find Pine Copper Lime on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, where you can find our full archive of past episodes there and take advantage of YouTube's free closed captioning service. All of this and more can be found at pinecopperlime.com. We also have a Patreon page, where supporters can join up at tiers that start at just a dollar a month, and they all help us to keep bringing you printmaking content every week. You can also get cool thank yous like stickers and totes, and if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check out the link in the show notes. Also, as some of you may know, we actually have a new special feature for our Patreon supporters, Shop Talk with our editor, Tim Pauschak. This is where he has quick and dirty tips and tricks, technical chit chat with our guests. So if you want to learn about what kind of paper they use and why, you can get that through Patreon at any level. It's also totally fine if you don't want to know more about that because times are tough and weird. And, uh, Maybe you want to save your pennies for actually getting to go eat in a restaurant now that you've been vaccinated. So if you just want to keep listening to the show and enjoy what you hear, we want you to do just that. Finally, if you want to show your love of printmaking to the world, we have merch of all kinds from fun designs to show your PCL support and make print jokes to confuse and or intrigue your friends and family. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. Pine Copper Lime is brought to you by Speedball Art Products, who've been offering a diverse range of high-quality products to your creative practice since 1997. Products like their line of professional screen printing tools. Speedball gives professional-grade quality that doesn't have to ruin your budget. Their aluminum squeegees, scoop coaters, and high mesh couch screens are perfectly suited to outfit your workspace without changing your books from black to red. So if you want to upgrade your space from hobbyist to pro, head on over to Speedball's website to see where you can pick up your new favorite setup. There's a link in the show notes. My guest this week is Angela Pilgrim, screen printer and founder of Fruition Press in Newark, New Jersey. We'll talk about the influence of the 1990s, Spice Girls, being a self-taught artist, and making it without university connections, identity, and the perseverance of learning how to print. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to make your dreams come to fruition with Angela Pilgrim. Hi, Angela. How's it going? Hi, it's doing, it's going pretty okay. I'm happy to um, join you on this podcast tonight. I'm really happy that you could join me. I feel like we've been playing email tag a little bit, so it's always really fun when things come together and we actually get to connect. So thank you for spending some of your evening with me. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would love it before we dive into your work and how you came to what you make and what influenced you and all of that great art talk, that great pine copper line talk. Could you please introduce yourself? And as I always ask my guests to just tell people who you are and where you are and what you do. Um, so my name is Angela Pilgrim. Um, I'm a printmaker and illustrator. Um, I'm based in Newark, New Jersey, and I've been printmaking for about about six years now. Mm. Um, it's been a, a amazing experience. I've learned a lot. Um, there's a lot more to learn, but um, I'm always up for that challenge when it comes to printmaking. Specifically, I've been working in uh, screen printing. Um, I've done a little bit of textile printing um, on fabric, um, on paper, and I've kind of dived into a uh, risography mm. um, just recently. I, I believe it was in 2019. I kind of tried my hand at it and I really, really loved it. Excellent. 
And then where did you grow up? And uh, what, what kind of role did art play in that time in your life? So I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, it's a pretty bustling city, has a lot of different colors and mm. people and um, just a lot of overall inspiration. Um, but I've always been um, drawn to art um, specifically. Um, I did a lot of drawing growing up, elementary school, um, even before that, I don't even know when I started drawing, but I just knew that it just kind of like took over mm. um, once I discovered that I just really loved to do it. It was kind of like a Zen for me. I didn't necessarily grow up in a rich upbringing or anything like that. So it was it was really a way to kind of like escape from where my family was at the time. It just, I remember um, just experiences as you know just being in school and elementary school and because I loved it so much I became like the art girl you right. know the person you go for you know the artwork and yeah. if I knew what I knew now <laughs> because we live in such a capitalist society I would have kind of flipped that a little bit and mm. got a little money but <laughs> mm -hmm. um but I love to do it and um I was really drawn to a lot of um, cartoons and anime. I was really into anime. Mm. And it was, it really served kind of like the, the, the ship to kind of like bring me to where I am now. And I've always been encouraged by my parents. Um, they've always, always encouraged me, always supported me. Um, so that kind of gave me a bigger drive to um, continue to do what I love to do. Wonderful. Yeah. And so if it was the the 1990s is that like yeah sailor moon yeah. dragon ball z what was your what was your anime of choice yeah it was definitely a lot of um sailor moon but um there was a lot of uh different i guess it's kind of like anime but it was like digimon and oh, things yeah, yeah. like that on you know uh just regular television and just like even watching Cartoon Network and seeing your Scooby-Doo and seeing all of these like, you know, nostalgic cartoons that I'm like, wow, like I would love to, you know, I've always thought about, you know, the people behind it and it would be great to kind of, you know, where did they get their inspiration from to be doing something like this and just broadcasting their art on television. And that really shaped kind of like my goal that was set to not specifically to be like super famous, but more so to do something I love to do. Um, but it definitely was Sailor Moon. And there was a really, really old anime um, called Ruroni Kenshin. And it was mm. like, I think it was like 90 to 100 episodes um, that I watched when I was <laughs> younger. And I was just really drawn to it. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really interesting time. Uh, uh, I was really into Spice Girls. I, it's, I was totally a 90s kid, so yeah. I was inspired by all these different colors, especially living in Patterson. I think that's so interesting that even as a young person, you were seeing the cartoons as art, which I think is so interesting because I, you know, I was an anime kid of the 90s myself and you know, watched what they had on Cartoon Network as an offering, but then I would go to blockbuster you know in the before four mm -hmm. four time with blockbuster yeah. you to the anime section and you know you couldn't google what any of it was you just had to grab whatever vhs or dvd they had and see what happened and you know sometimes you'd, you'd get it home and exactly. it'd be like oh god like yes. <laughs> i got it I, this isn't what yes. i wanted yes but um but even though I loved it so much, I never really thought of it as art. You know, I got I got very involved in the aesthetic of it, which I, I loved. I love the look of it. But I love how mm -hmm. you, as a budding artist, were already thinking about, okay, this is something someone drew. This is something that someone is making their career off of. Yeah, definitely. And just to, because I was so much in love with, you know, these different characters that I was looking at, it was like, okay, well... I need to learn how to, I was naturally drawn to drawing people mm -hmm. because, you know, these cartoons were expressed from, you know, um, the characteristics of people, even if it was a dog or an animal or something like that, that talked, you know, at the time. So 
you know, I would find myself just like, you know, I, this is what I want to do. So I would find myself kind of weirdly staring at people to kind of study <laughs> their face and, you know, like, oh, that's the shape of their eye and kind of break it down into shapes. And that really lended a hand. And just to go back to your, your blockbuster um, mm. comment, um, it's really interesting because um, I really liked the aesthetic as well of the 90s and also the 80s um, yeah. when I look back, like, you know, when I was older. But um, what I, I realized was that, you know, I guess subconsciously I kind of drew a lot of inspiration in my own work making it now um, and the different eras that I kind of like cover. It, it's just the there is a analog aspect of it that is really, really warm and kind of nostalgic, which is really nice, too. So sad to see Blockbuster had left. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so when you say analog, do you mean in that? in the drawing style in that in that way that it's like a, a person yeah. and I think now you know everything is done on computers when they go to make cartoons but at one point exactly. it was rows and rows of artists drawing by hand with those little plastic mm-hmm. transparencies yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. definitely and I'm actually learning a little bit about procreate right now and just looking back at those old videos with like the rotoscoping and how you know people really these artists created these you know animations and it was again based off of like real movements and it was it's just the breakdown of it is really um amazing um so it's it's really amazing experience just to be an artist to be honest there's just so many avenues yeah well and i think particularly if you're open to all the different things that art can be you know if you're if you don't have this really narrow focus that Art is oil on a canvas that hangs in a museum, which I think some mm-hmm. people think. <laughs> and, yeah. and that you, you grew up with that openness of seeing uh, cartoons, which I think some people will just be like, oh, it's just a cartoon. And you'd be like, no, it's, it's thousands and thousands of drawings <laughs> is what it is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think if people really saw the back, you know, a lot of times people see the art and they don't see what led up to creating that art and you know you can go into an artist studio and you can see all these great works but if the artist really broke down how they did it and why they did it then it's like a whole nother appreciation for it so I think it's really education as well and taking the time to you know want to learn about it for like sure. anything yeah for sure so I guess speaking of it's a good way to to segue into my next question which is about education and I'm wondering if you could tell us about your career path as a self-taught artist. So my my uh, career path, um, specifically leading up to just being a printmaker, traditionally I was doing a lot of illustration for a lot of different, like for a long, long time. Mm. And then at some point I just was like, man, I really need to, I love what I'm doing, but I really need to challenge myself. And at that particular time in 2015, I said, well, you know, I don't, you know, I'm self-taught. I didn't go and have all these great connections with all these, you know, uh, institutions and people within institutions. So a lot of it was kind of paving my own way, um, which I liked. I liked that. I like having that in my hand to be able to do that, um, just to kind of challenge myself. But what I learned was that um, I was able to kind of create opportunities for myself. So I applied for um, a residency in 2015 in Newark. And it was an artist in residence program um, by the North Print Shop. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a juried proposal process that I had to submit my work and what I was going to create while I was in this like fully functional print shop. And I, you know, I think I applied like the last day <laughs> of the, uh, yeah, I, I really, yeah, it was the last day. And, you know, I remember like a month later or so just getting, you know, receiving, you know, the congratulations for it. And I was like, okay, this is like my chance to do something different. I know Mm. nothing about printmaking, you know, but I'm willing to learn. And it was just interesting. And the only reason I knew about it was because I was on a newsletter for the print shop. And I remember at the time um, I walked into the print shop when it was very grassroots and it was they were at another location and I just stumbled upon it. And I was introduced to it kind of like in this uh, really organic way. 
and this was like maybe a year or two late, um, before that. So I knew about the place and it was just a place where it was like a lot of artists coming together and creating and learning about printmaking. Um, there was a specific master printer there, uh, Stephen McKenzie, who pretty much showed me like everything I needed to know about printmaking. So um, with that, um, again, we'll fast forward. I applied mm-hmm. in 2015 received the residency and then I was like okay well I'm gonna create my biggest biggest proposal idea was to create black women on these large fabric you know just stretch fabric and you know I just wanted to kind of dive into black beauty and womanhood and how it's perceived in the world you know and that was like my overall message because at the time I was also discovering things about myself so I felt like it was really a full expression of who I was at the time and which continues to bud and, you know, grow. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was so interesting. So you applied for it without any background in printmaking. Did you sort of know about it a bit? I mean, I know that probably you knew Silkscreen, that's sort of the, you know, the one that most people know. Um, Mm -hmm. But did you have a lot of experience or did you come to it with any sense of expectation? I I totally came to it with no experience Mm. at all. Um, I think that I might have, if I can kind of go into my memory bank, Mm. maybe I went to an open print club night and they were, it's basically like a a open Wednesday night where the community um, comes to the print shop and for ten dollars, they would they would be able to learn how to print. Um, so, it it was a lot of folks from the North community that I didn't know, and this was like a bustling new art scene. So everything was very new at the time. I was living in Hackensack, um, New Jersey. Mm. So it was kind of like a just jump in the pond, and so to speak. And I think that I yeah I learned maybe just like maybe one. It was one night that I came after stumbling upon the print shop Mm. one day, you know, and I was, you know, hey, come back again. You know, we have these open Wednesday nights and for $10, you can, you know, print on paper, you could print on a t-shirt, you know, we'll show you how to create, you know, your work through uh, the computer and how they get it on a screen. And at the time I didn't really register what was really going on. A lot of it was just like, okay, nod and just kind of observe. So I said, hey, you know, I don't know everything there needs to know about printmaking, but I'm willing to learn and I was willing to challenge myself. I think I was really ready for that at the time. Yeah, that's good. And then and then it just kind of obviously it had this influence on you where it, it continued in your practice. And now yeah. you identify as a printmaker. What do you think it was about printmaking that really that made you realize that you wanted this to be a part of your art practice in a major way? So I think at the time, because I was just so, I was just so bored of what I was doing and it was like, hey, I really need to challenge myself. Um, I, when I got the residency, I felt like that was the chance to do that. But not only that, you know, what I loved about it was it it really taught me a lot of life lessons. Um, Just thinking about six years ago, I think I was 22. So I'm very young and, Mm. you know, young to this art scene that is, you know, continuing to grow. And it was actually growing way before I was there, you know, but it's just continuing to be this beautiful thing. And it really taught me just spending 15 hours like in the print shop at once because I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn. And it was just like it really taught me perseverance. Mm. It really uh, taught me because screen printing is definitely not something where it's like this, oh, you know, paintbrush on the cam is not saying anything about it's not hard to paint or anything. I don't want, you know, to make anybody feel, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, it was it was just there's a lot of um, involvement in your full body. Um, yes. Your back, your arms, your So at the time, it was just like, you know, how can I kind of create my mind to be focused on something that I want to do and I can persevere and be determined to learn something at the same time? And it really challenged me to kind of stick with something that, you know, um, may be hard, but Mm -hmm. a challenge is a challenge and a challenge can be a good thing 
And it took me a while, actually, when I was printing to kind of be okay with mistakes. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was, you know, the misprints and the, you know, you didn't apply enough pressure on the screen or, hey, there's not enough ink or, you know, the screen is, you know, it could have been burned better. You know, you got to start the whole process over, you know. It really challenged me in really, really great ways about patience as well. For a very long time of the residency, like for a good four months where I was just going crazy about making the work that I said I'm going to make. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, wow, like, you know, I really have to be patient with I'm, I'm learning, you know, yeah. um, but I'm also challenging myself to be really great at it. I love it. The challenge and the, yeah. And and that what you're saying about it being a full body experience is so true. And I think something that, you know, artists who really like to live their work, I think are often drawn to printmaking in that way of just, yeah. that, you know, leaning over and pulling a giant squeegee across a, a huge print and you have to get the pressure just right and, and the angle just right and all of that. It's, it really is, is skill and that corporeal art making for sure. Yeah. And it can be very empowering, you know, mm. to just know that, you know, there's a lot of strength and, you know, if you look back at pictures of yourself and, you know, for myself at least, but if you look back at, you know, I look back at pictures and say to myself, well, you know what, I feel the most empowered doing something that I love to do Mm. and you can see the determination and you know the focus and you know I think that was really a driving force to really stay with it and it was really really um, a great thing to be a black woman doing it Mm. in a place that maybe you know it was a new residency program but you know I didn't really have any kind of like blueprint other than my foremothers that I was learning Mm. just learning about but you know I didn't have a blueprint for okay this person who looks like me came here and you know made work and really really you know really showed up and showed out, you know, to kind of like, you know, pass the baton to me. So I felt a lot of pressure on me to be really, really good at what I'm doing Mm. because that opened the door for more people uh, who look like me to want to do that. So that was really important. And that sense of education and community really stuck with me. So to switch gears a little bit and talk kind of more Mm -hmm. directly about your practice and your subject Mm -hmm. matter. And so you were saying that you draw inspiration from the subject of black beauty and womanhood and how that's perceived in the world. And I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit about your experiences with this growing up and maybe specifically in the the framework of when I read or listen to podcasts or something about kind of cultural criticism of the 1990s. You know, one of the things that comes up over and over again is that in the 1990s, was very white, very blonde, very thin. (laughs) You know, these were the kind of the, like the classic icons of the 90s. And, you know, I mean, we had Mel B in the Spice Girls, but Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. she was definitely, yeah, she was an outlier. And so, and, you know, not even a, you know, not even from American culture. So I'd love to just talk about considering that the aesthetic of your work and is is rooted a lot in that look of the 90s and kind of how it relates to that time when we were not seeing diverse examples of beauty in women, even even less so than now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. My journey with my womanhood has been very, very interesting because um, a lot of me growing up was kind of trying to maneuver in this world of figuring out who I was and why I was important. You know, a lot of it came from maybe just what, again, like what we see in media and, you know, a lot of shame around who I was or what I looked like. Mm -hmm. At one point I was, I didn't even refer to myself as like black. Like I referred to myself as clear, Mm -hmm. you know, and what type of, you know, you know, narrative is that, you know, when you show up as this person and the society doesn't see you as that. Right. But I didn't think I didn't think I think deeply about how my presence can be not only, you know, a 
it can be something that could be very joyful, but it can also be something that's very threatening Mm -hmm. and me not understanding that uh, growing up. But, you know, drawing to these figures that I'm seeing in in the media and saying, okay, well, I don't want to wear my hair natural. I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's it really it really strips away if you don't have like really, really strong and, and I say strong loosely, but more so um, figures that can really be, my mom is a big mentor to me, but she can only teach me from what she knows and from her own experience. So, you know, if she didn't have those experiences, because I'm darker than her, she's very, very light skin, you know, she has her own set of things that she dealt with as well. Mm. That may be parallel to mine, but with that, if you're not, seeing that as like you know uh, at the forefront of what you're being taught all the time you're looking for it outside and you have all this media around you and this is what is telling you what is right and what is you know what is wrong and you know and I found myself you know straightening my hair and you know uh, we grew up with perms you know Mm -hmm. and I I speak about it in my work now you know this is what really shaped my childhood and it was like is this a shameful thing or is this something that should empower us and why are we doing these Mm -hmm. things in my adult years I had to look for that inspiration that I wasn't directly being taught um growing up but I had to kind of discover it on my own and I always look at my work as kind of like a it's like a, a legacy of discovering oneself Hmm. as a black woman in America, you know, the world and, uh, you know, amplifying the the intricacies of that and how beautiful it is and how important it is. And it's expressed through your appearance. It's expressed Mm -hmm. through your life and your traditions and your triumphs and your struggles. And that's what was really, really important for me. I think things happen at a certain time when you need to. And I felt like it was a rebirth of who I was, especially mm-hmm. when I got this residency. I'm learning something new. And then I'm going into this actually creating work that amplifies what matters to me was really so important. And what I've learned along the way was that there was a lot of parallel narratives to my, you know, my experience being able to be around other black artists and 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 other women now and having really a community really showed me that you know we kind of went through the same thing Mm -hmm. you know and it's like that's what makes that person really connect with the work which is so important you know sitting at the stove on a sunday and you have a hot comb to your hair because your mom is saying we have to get ready for church and Mm. I have to straighten your hair and this is what it you know this is what is is deemed appropriate Mm. you know and you have big curls and you know because I straighten your hair and curled it into a curl because it has to be me and you know you it's kind of like indoctrined Mm -hmm. in us and it's almost like you have to rediscover yourself and rediscover why you're important and why you should talk about that if that makes sense yeah absolutely no that that makes sense that makes a lot of sense, and I think that I think that a lot of people can identify with that experience of of particularly growing up and having these things that are part of your life that you don't really question because you're just a little kid, right? You're like, this is mm-hmm. this is the world, yeah. this is the universe, this is all I know, and then going out into the world and finding your own way and meeting someone and saying, oh my gosh, that happened to you as well. Did, did that, how did that feel for you? It's really powerful. And I think it's, yeah. it's particularly powerful for people who are in marginalized communities. I think it's something that queer kids experience on a huge way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just this idea of, of oh, I, I feel so much a connection with you because we didn't know each other, but we were going through the same thing. And, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's really as I think you say, like empowering and beautiful to then have that experience as a as a grown person and to feel sort of seen and, and validated in the experiences that you've had. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So it's a great journey. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's it's uh, the the journey of self discovery and and growth is it's really a blessing to be able to be on it for sure. Yeah. So you were talking about, you know, maybe kind of looking for 
idols for black beauty and it sounded like you've you you found some or in your journey you, you did come to find people who you could kind of look to and see reflected back something that felt more true to you do you have any particular women in mind or any women that you draw inspiration uh-huh. from even today yeah definitely and of course you know you have Elizabeth Catlett mm. and you have your four mothers and Emma Amos and all these great um black female print makers that I I learned about that actually you know spoke about things that really mattered to me as well but you know just what I saw in media you know Diana Ross and Donna Summer mm. and you know, these performers who were really, really honing in on who they were and, you know, what that represented, like that really, really raw womanhood that like, you know, a lot of people really looked up to. And I particularly um, remember I when I started my residency, I had to revisit all of these different uh, black hair ads and mm. get inspiration from that. And magazines and 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 poetry where you know these black women were talking about the experience and and maybe it wasn't in a a visual you know you would probably say a little bit visual because you know those words become visual Mm -hmm. as you think about them but more so in a you know this eloquent way that really helped me kind of connect to their body of work too I think I continue to learn more and, and I think the great thing about you know, the time that we're in is it's that all of these women who kind of like shaped the path for all of these things to happen and for people to feel empowered birth, it kind of birthed new women who you can draw inspiration from. You see it on Instagram, Mm. media, you know, um, just, and even, even people in your home, like, you know, there's, there's poets here in Newark, you know, Mm. there's artists you know, there's poetry circles, there's muralists here, you know, that have a story as well. And, and those people matter, too. So I draw inspiration from a, a lot of different things, um, and a lot of different people. And it's not just limited to media, but it was definitely influenced. A lot of my work is influenced by yeah. um, what would be the token of what everybody have seen before, mm. you know, in media. So, yeah. And so, and in terms of the actual aesthetic of the work, you know, it really has this 80s, 90s, you know, I guess late 80s, early 90s feel to it. And you've really managed to capture it so well. Like it it looks like, you know, it just, it has this feeling so strongly of what is up on the wall of salons when I was a kid, you know, going to, mm-hmm. going to get my, my haircut for $5 at Supercuts or whatever it was doing. And, <laughs> and, and I'm wondering kind of how you go about capturing that. And if you use your uh, experience as an illustrator to sort of do so and kind of breaking down an image and understanding what's important, you know, as you were talking about, like looking at someone's eyes and, understanding the shape of them and how that lets you identify who this is an illustration of. And if you use that mind at all to say, okay, how do I make this look like it's from this time and place and really get that message really clearly just without words, just using the visuals to do so. So I am a really, really big fan of color and really like complementary, not just color, but complementary colors that evoke some type of emotion. I'm really drawn to the color pink Mm. because it's just so warm and, you know, I think it's just so expressive on in its own right. And I've always been drawn to that. But I create mood boards um, Mm. where I'm, you know, different uh, patterns and things that I would be you know, um, African patterns, you know, sometimes. And it's like, how can I, you know, reconstruct this to kind of look like mine? Mm. Um, there's, I'm really into photography. That's one of the things that I don't really talk too much about, but that was really what shaped my eye growing up, especially throughout high school and elementary school. So what I would do is I would take my camera everywhere. So I would look at patterns, not even just on media, but just like in the world, you know, it's like, hey, this pattern looks really, really nice. This is like, kind of like a, 
you know, a swirly type of, you know, feel and it makes me feel happy and it makes me feel because a lot of my work is um, expressing these women in really, really happy states and yeah. empowered expressive and um and comfortable and having some air of confidence so i'm using these uplifting colors to kind of amplify that but um creating mood boards and you know studying different artists but saying okay well how do i shape my voice around what i'm trying to convey i like that little part but you know i would do it a little bit different so mm. let me draw this and see how this works and it's a lot of experimentation um, I, I like to think of my head as like all these gears turning and just like, you know, I can be asleep and say, okay, well, let me go to my notes and, you know, write something down because there's, you know, uh, a concept I want to explore, you know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I have books upon books about, you know, just different concepts that I wanted to explore earlier on in my art career that I forgot about, but I can revisit and say, okay, well, now that I've learned all this, how can I express this in a way that makes sense for where I am now Mm, yeah no that makes a lot of sense that that's sort of it's sounds almost like it's more intuitive that you draw from everything you're kind of letting into your life in this sort of conscious way exactly and exactly yeah, and I was thinking about it in a very precise way <laughs> very like like yeah, if I could, you could it's... find the formula but that's not it yeah no it's not it's very intuitive but it's also a a spiritual thing like I don't really say this often but um one of the things that I actually do before I is kind of like a method to like my madness is I always pray before Mm. I make a piece you know and it kind of connects me to my work as well and it kind of gives me a um it aids me in kind of expressing what I want to say in the most purest and honest way um so it's it's it could be looked at as weird, but it makes sense for me. <laughs> you know, it makes it makes because it's important. Sense. It's really it is it is, and and I think that in the act of prayer, one of the things that that you're doing is kind of getting out of your own way. You know, you're saying right. You're saying I am not the most important thing. I am not the center of the universe. There is something bigger than me. And you're you're stepping exactly. you're stepping out of that me 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 sort of thing that we can get into, and I think it's one of the exactly the best things you can do before trying to create something is to just shut that ego down a bit and and say like okay like yeah. what what is God or what is the universe going to give to me in this moment? This, right. That's yeah. No, I think I definitely understand. I always look at myself as. I look at myself as a vessel Mm -hmm. more so than, you know, like you said, like really thinking about the I, I, I mantra, but just, you know, how can I be a better service to people through my work? Mm -hmm. You know, um, how I'm expressing it. That's why I'm so drawn to community. Like one of the great aspects of having that residency was able, me being able to go into that print shop and one of the, um, exchanges of being a resident was, hey, you have to, you know, be a shop monitor mm. for two days. And, you know, there's going to be folks who have questions about things. And that really made me have to learn about things. But not only that, you know, what I got really pumped up for was the um, open print nights, because that's mm. when the whole community comes. Yeah. And I can really be there with that person. I've met so many beautiful people that have come through that print shop that I'm still friends with to today. And it's just, it's amazing, you know, and just to be able to help someone create something that means a lot to them and then express it in a way that they haven't done before, because this is, I was there, you know, so that's really important to me. So it's, it's this whole spiritual community thing that I really try to amplify behind my work. And it's kind of the intricacies of what is seen through my work. That yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's, you know, that's one of the, the, the themes of the podcast that I love that I never get sick of philosophizing about is this the way that printmaking creates community and keeps community together. There's something about exactly. a print shop, there's something about the magic of of pulling ink through a silk screen and lifting up the screen 
And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's something that there wasn't there before. And it has this magic moment that you don't get with other forms of art. You don't, you don't get it with, uh, with, with painting, you know, there's, you don't have the, that sparkle moment when you lift up the paper, you lift up the screen and there it is. It's the complete image and it, people are just drawn to it and, and drawn and want to be a part of it. Yeah. And, and if you think about it in a, in a, uh, just like a philosophical kind of point of view, you think about it's just ideas materialized in a, in a, something that's tangible that somebody can take, not in a way where it's, you know, they can, they can hold the image on the surface, right? So it is tangible, but then also just knowing that this thing that you thought of is actually existing now like if you Mm. think about everything that's around us started as a thought you know so thoughts become things so it's 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 really um it's really beautiful yeah i it's so funny you should say that because one of my pet peeves is when people in marketing refer to something as curated like oh this is a it's a curated selection of wines or it's a curated and i'm like literally everything is curated like everything you interact with yeah somebody chose yeah. what to put in it and what not to put in it and like and it's just you're just mm-hmm. you're just saying something that doesn't mean anything and I think it kind of reflects on what you're saying about how you know everything that we we touch from like the notepad that I'm writing into the pen you know, somebody made a decision that it needed to be in the world and put thought and effort into how that should happen and exactly yeah yeah and to to create the the hierarchy of of oh like this is art and this isn't art it 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 breaks down really quickly when you start to get into the nuts and bolts of it and so I, I had I was sort of curious too about looking looking at some of your work and it's I've noticed that you'll you'll actually place specific products in it um like the uh mango butter um or you've got incredible image of a of a woman at at a table and you know she's on the the right side of the of the composition and she's got a comb and she's sort of you know she's touching her hair and she has a product sort of facing the viewer almost like it's an advert or something like that yeah, and, and I'm curious about yeah your use of these specific brands. Is it is it brands that you had a connection to growing up? Is it something that speaks to sort of community for you? Where did they come from? These product that almost like the product placement, for lack of a better word, that yeah, appears in your yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about it like that, but yeah, that's true. Oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so a lot of these um, products were um, products that I definitely was introduced to when I was younger um, mm. and it's kind of become like an, an icon in a way that kind of connects the narrative between someone who used that before in their childhood to my narrative so it kind of connects you know that viewer to the work and say well I see you and I know mm. how you know on Sundays you were sitting there and you were getting your hair braided and you had this blue magic sitting there you know your mom was dipping her finger on a hot summer you know morning (laughs) and she was just you know greasing your scalp or you know on a Sunday when you know your mom had to put this hair dressing to make sure that you know and it sizzled Mm. you know and you remember the smell you remember, you know, how it felt. You remember having to hold your ear because that hot comb, if it, if it hit your ear, you knew you were done for, <laughs> you know. So it's kind of these different products definitely is very it goes back to like the um, the subject of nostalgia, mm. you know. And yes, these things can have like a derogatory when you think a uh, kind of nature about it mm. um, in a way where it's like, OK, you were using these products to straighten your hair but they also were used to grow your hair. Mm. This is what we were taught. Like we've, we've grown so much in the natural hair community now with so many products that we didn't have, yeah. you know, back at that time. And it's like, this is all we had, you know, and there, there weren't, you know, uh, business owners that were taking a chance and black business owners who were taking a chance on their product because they really, you know, they were getting all this, you know, money and backing for it. 
maybe they were, but on a small scale, but all of these commercial products were, you know, what we grabbed, you know, yeah. and we used, and it became kind of part of our hair rituals. And I think that was so important to connect that nostalgic time to, you know, how we view our hair now and what we've learned. It's mm. kind of learning from the journey. And specific um, uh, work that you um, that you mentioned, Sabrina Gets Ready, yeah. that's the, the title yeah. of it. Um, so that particular work was really interesting because I, at the time, aside from me being kind of like, I feel like I'm like a, a Jill of all trades, right? Uh-huh. So aside from me, of um, hopefully a master of all, <laughs> but, uh, but one thing that I love to do is I like to design. Um, mm. So, you know, I didn't go to school for design. No, I didn't. Like anything else I've done in my art career, I've challenged myself. So what I attempted to do and I succeeded and I'm very proud of it was I created these these perm boxes and these perm mm. boxes were um, homage to the perm boxes that we use when we were younger straightening our hair but instead of putting all of these you know oh this is what's you know this is what's going to make your hair look this way I flipped it and said okay well love your natural hair and it's it's you know it's a a picture of a woman with natural hair Mm -hmm. and then in the back it's like you know the ingredients of you know and the mantra that you should teach yourself Mm -hmm. and it's not to say that women shouldn't have every other hairstyle we're very versatile yeah and and our hair is very sculptural which is beautiful right so we can do so many things and it's so you know tough and you know we can uh we can withstand a lot to our hair but What I wanted to highlight with that project was just, you know, love your natural hair. So I decided to have like a photo shoot to kind of like show off those boxes. And um, my friend photographer, he shot them and I got a few models in the community Mm. of Newark. And we just wanted to create this Afro Sheen type inspired photo shoot. Mm. And from that, I was, you know, with the narrative continuing I got these beautiful photos that I absolutely love and I didn't really go so, so far with it because it was like, what am I going to do with these boxes? It's just like a project, right? Yeah. But it really took on a life of its own because from those pictures, I then illustrated the same picture, but then I turned it into a recent graph and then, you know, Mm. it just, Mm. it's kind of like reimagining what that narrative can look like in different uh, forms of, of medium. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love it when when printmaking, you know, sort of migrates from just this, it's, it's, it's on Reeves BFK and we put it in a frame, you know, like, and then, then yeah. we're done. Um, but yeah. it's, and, and it kind of, you've actually, yeah, created a, uh, a new, a, a new object in the world that people can then interact with and, and then the photo shoot and then having brain turned back into print. That's just, yeah, yeah. it's a great journey. Oh, that's great. In the time that we've got left, you have founded a Florician Press? Is it, how do I say it? Yes. Please help me. So it's, um, it's uh, Fruition. Fruition. Ah, So it's like Fruition. So it's like fruits and then, you know, Oshun and how she's kind of like the, uh, kind of like the mother of, I like to say realizing what you can do. So it's Mm. like fruits that are becoming, it's kind of back to that kind of mantra of, you know, a thought that is turned tangible because you just thought of it and then you created it. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I just named it Fruition. So yeah, so I founded Fruition Press in 2018 and it was really kind of like a, it was an answer to not having a space to work, which, you know, for artists like spaces, it's just, it could be super hard, Yeah. especially when COVID hit. And even before that, like I was kind of taking a hiatus from like, you know, making a whole bunch of new work because how I envisioned my space to be was to make sure that I had all of my materials, you know, I can just roll over and I can just print. Mm. So I was actually able to do that. And I created a um, space in my apartment, which um, 
it housed about 50 screens. Oh, wow. Um, I have a, yeah, and, and actually, you know, it's, it's a blessing. It truly is because a few years before that, I was thinking, man, I need screens. And then I just got hooked up with some screens like that a print shop didn't need anymore. Like (laughs) it just happened that way. And it was because I knew this person and I was, you know, this person knew this person, you know, so it was really, really, it just happened in a really organic way when it needed to be. And that's when I knew, okay, now I need to like really get more stuff and, from there, you know, I acquired two exposure units. Um, and then I have like a, a one arm press and I have my inks and I said, okay, well, hey, listen, I'm, instead of paying for some type of studio space somewhere, you know, at that time I said, let me just make do with what I have. So um, I created all of these prints, my most recent prints in my uh, studio now, which is, um, I'm now moved because I'm expanding, but Mm. um, in that apartment and it just kind of took on um, a life of its own because before COVID hit, my plan was to have these one on one workshops to kind of like make sure that I can kind of like, you know, focus in on with one person and kind of show them how to print and, you know, to kind of, again, make a idea turn into something tangible and just have some some type of skill that can aid in some type of monetary opportunity yeah. you know a lot of folks that came into the print shop like I saw them making these amazing things and then they you would see them at different shows around Newark and, and mm. they're selling their shirts and it mm-hmm. was beautiful so I said man if I can do more of that within my own confines of my space that'll be great and I just start small you know and just having that uh, sense of community, you know, um, that is being taught by me specifically. Um, so I continue to expand. Um, my studio has expanded now. So shortly in a few weeks, I'll be, you know, uh, developing a little bit more of the space. And then I'll show like on social media and things like that. And then at some point, I believe, you, you know, this COVID thing kind of I don't know where we going with COVID, but, yeah. you know, if it kind of gets alleviated, then um, I would like to um, introduce people into the space to kind of continue that that goal of yeah. making sure that people are making things and education and and giving them visibility. You know, you can be a novice or you can be an advanced print, a printmaker mm-hmm. and teach me something, you know, yeah. it, it can just take on a life of its own. So. But mostly it's it's definitely education and visibility at the forefront, definitely. Yeah. Oh, that's that sounds great. That is really exciting. Um I'm I'm jealous that I don't I can't come and see it in person. <laughs> that sounds like a really Hopefully beautiful one thing day. building. Yeah, I would love it. Again, it's like I feel that way about about COVID where it's just, you know, I mean, I haven't been home in two years. I miss my family so much and I yeah. I would love to be back in the states for a while but it's just this this barrier of just not knowing and we we have a lot of reason to be hopeful but it, you know you yeah. don't know until you know and and you know then there's all these other questions about okay then like is the airline industry going to be ready to accept people and all kinds of all kinds of things yeah exactly so, exactly yeah. well before we say goodbye can you please tell our dear listeners where they can find Fruition Press, where they can find you, where they can buy cool t-shirts and prints from you and support you and your work and follow along with the growth of the press and all that good stuff. Okay, so um, I've been navigating the Instagram web right now. Um, so uh, my handle is at a pilgrim, so that's at a P-L-G-R-M. Mm. Um, my Fruition Press can be found at at Fruition, F-R-U-I-S-H-U-N, Press. And um, I have a brand that is slowly going to open up, hopefully later on this year, um, where I can just have like small prints and things like that, where, you know, folks can get things at affordable prices. Mm. Um, and that's at at F-R-U-I-S-H-U-N, Fruition. Mm. And um, I can be found on AngelaPilgrim.com. Um, and you can read about Fruition Press Studio there on that webpage. Excellent. 
Well, I will I will put links to all of that, and then so yeah, it's like fruition the press, fruition the brand, and Angela Pilgrim <laughs> the artist. I will put links to yes. to all of those different <laughs> ways people can can follow your work and and what you do and. Thank you so much for spending some time with me, and it was just great to to talk about the the '90s with another like like '90s kid yeah. and and connect and and learn about what's going on in the New York art scene. It sounds really interesting, so I I do hope I get a chance to see it, and I hope uh, you get a chance to come see Bangkok. I if you if you love color, Bangkok is a great place to be it's the the food the print here it's it's really really vibrant constant like color and stimulus wherever you look so I, I think you'd like it here thank you thank you and I'm, I'm definitely going to take your honeymoon uh tips as well yes. and uh I want to thank you so much. Um, I'm always so grateful for any opportunity to just speak about my work and, you know, just to be connected with you folks. And please keep in touch. And I'm here, whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Guy Levine. We'll talk about learning mesotint before YouTube, tool making, the human body as communicator. You won't want to miss it. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week.